Well, hello there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. And this is episode number 354. That's 354. How you feeling? How you doing? Great. Amazing. How am I? You know, just hanging on in there, taking one day at a time, keeping a smile on my face. As you can see, if you're watching the video podcast, if it's your first time tuning in via the YouTube, of course, make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe and leave me a comment down below. If you're listening via the podcast app, leave me a five star review and share the show with your friends. And if you want to continue supporting the show and get access to the audio version of the full entire show, audio version of the show, two days ahead of everybody else, make sure you sign down below to the Patreon at patreon.com forward slash agostino that's patreon.com forward slash a g o s t i n h o it's in the description down below so click that link for as little as one dollar a month you can sponsor this show and obviously get access to my entire archive of over 300 shows as well as the audio version of this entire podcast a couple of days ahead of everybody else so make sure you sign up down below for that anyway what else is going on bum buddy bum buddy bum it's actually um really warm here in london i'm guessing most of my listeners are not residing in london but if you are in the uk you would know that the temperature here has been you know it's been mad and people are melting all over the place people are complaining about it which is you know one of the most boring things in the world i think complaining about the heat in the uk is similar to like when people um tell you about their holidays you know a work colleague told you about their holidays in detail hopefully can, can you hear all that stuff on the street i'm hoping you can't right but let's see um it's similar to when someone tells you yeah their holiday you know escapades in detail when they've come back from one and you're still at work you know slugging away your laptop or on the shop floor it gets it's cute for like an hour and after that you have to kind of like you know keep that to yourself similar to the whole heat debate if you're hot and you're melting i don't care you know write a letter post it to someone that that cares about you and hopefully they read it and reply back but as much as you know as much as a bit of an anomaly for it to be warm here i understand the need to kind of share your experience or document it oh you know i'm talking about documenting where have all those people gone that were like saying day 45 of lockdown where are those people where are they right because i'm sure they were all kind of secretly hoping that quarantine or the lockdown would be over you know quarantine, the lockdown would be over like i don't know the end of march so that they could like blossom right like a butterfly but nah 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 nah, nah not so <laughs> i should be laughing but it was funny seeing everybody have those that same formulaic post like day 55 of quarantine of lockdown i'm gonna do it it's like shut the hell up god almighty has anyone else like to hate humanity <laughs> during this whole period or is it just me you just look at people and think god you're just so weak so lily livid but anyway I, I, you know that's obviously the wrong way to think about things i think we've all been going through a really tough time if anything this should give people more sympathy to be a little bit more understanding of everyone's situation because you know it doesn't matter how poor or how rich you are you've going to be affected by this lockdown there's no no one really survives this unless you're like you know a millionaire and a double digits or a billionaire right you're gonna you're gonna feel this one way or the other and having no means of income or having people not actually spend or move around as they need to or as they will require is definitely going to impact you in some way shape or form so you know this should probably be a time when people feel a bit more sympathetic but judging by what's happening on social judging by all the takedowns and all the cancellations i think people just don't care if anything think what actually happens when you have a play you have like a pandemic right like a plague or something you'd think people kind of band around and sort of get a bit more um i don't know just become a little bit more nicer to each other because you sort of have to depend on your neighbor for certain things that you didn't know you needed actually what ends up happening is that people start to become a little bit more um they start to become a little bit more bitter they start to become a little bit more agitated they're obviously angry and frustrated that they're not where they need to be in life so that they get impacted by stuff like this right this is a rare occasion where people with f you money are really kind of you know standing with their chest up telling you hey you saw see what i told you guys about saving or those guys that do that um was it financially independent financial independence stuff where they save like you know 60 percent of their salary maybe 70 so that they can retire really early right and then they invest the savings into bonds and stocks and stuff let that stuff accumulate and then live on a reduced salary so that when you do end up quitting you've kind of got a better runway and obviously you've got that recurring income for the, from the stocks and stuff coming in and they they're, they're sort of a fringe group online i'm sure they've got subreddits and books and stuff but they're a bit of a wacky kind of you know i live in a camper van um my living room turns into a kitchen and a bathroom sort of people but now you're probably looking at them thinking they probably have something in it same people are living the barge 
I bet you now if you walk across, if you walk down the canal or wherever you live and you see someone living in a barge or in a boat, you're definitely going to be looking at them thinking, God damn it, man, you've got it made, innit? Yeah? They have to pay whatever tax or rent they have to pay to, to kind of be posted up on that lake. Um, and everything else is just, you know, they can minimize expenses drastically compared to you and I who have to keep, you know, this roof over our heads and pay for this electricity that's wired, powering all this nonsense. So, you know, if anything, it kind of would make you be a bit more, in, it would probably steer you towards being a bit more embittered, really, right? Um, but you shouldn't really, you know, you should use this as an opportunity to be like, hey, what do I really need? What is, what's my life actually about? What am I actually trying to accomplish? What actually brings me the most joy? And then trying to maximize that when stuff gets sorted out. You shouldn't be looking at it as like a point of like, oh, I don't have this and he has that. It's like, hmm, that's not really constructive. It's not really going to be beneficial. And it's not really going to get you out of the situation we're in anymore. Do you know what I mean? So if anything, it's just going to exasperate the effects of it and just make you feel so bad about everything that's going on. Again, my opinion, what the hell do I know? Anyway, got a jam-packed show today, mad stuff to dig into, loads of updates on other cases that I've spoken about prior, so let's not waste any more time, let's get right on into it. So, one, Mesut Ozu. Um, I try not to speak about football on here too tough because I'm aware that most people don't really give a crap about football, but there is also interesting stories that develop from it um, that could probably be applied to, you know, life in general. Now, I've been the Mesut Ozil one. This beard as well. Once I'm drinking or even eating, it's so mad because now my moustache actually goes over my lip. So when I drink, I get these little you know, droplets that form across it. It's a bit nasty, but if anything, this heat is probably pretty to get a haircut. Look how long the sides of my hair are. But anyway, Mesut Ozil. Mesut Ozil. Um, former German international World Cup winner. Um, an absolutely, you know, star boy of a player in, at his prime, signed at Arsenal as probably an indication that Arsenal were trying to achieve big things. They were trying to rewrite the wrongs of the past and trying to basically get back to where they were, right? Challenging for titles, challenging for Champions Leagues and not just winning FA Cups and finishing fourth. So there was a lot riding on Ozu. Ozu was a lot more than just a signing for a club. He kind of was a symbol of where he was maybe an indication of where Arsenal intended to go, what direction they wanted to go to but if you look at Ozo and you look at kind of his um, playing style and his position actually on the pitch being a conventional number 10 you kind of ex you should have maybe saw the writing on the wall that his time was going to be over or his time was going to be up especially if you were trying to compete with the Liverpools of this world who play a high pressing style of football which you know for the most part whenever a team is successful in a champ in the premier league for the most part yeah most most leagues don't like this but in the premier league if you're the champions and you play a certain way usually the teams below you will also try to implement that style of play in order to kind of emulate because they see it works week in week out so as soon as that kind of heavy metal style of football from Liverpool became the vogue thing and, you know, forwards pressing defenders and pushing up really high and, you know, players um, kind of interchanging positions and being fluid and the whole false nine thing was kind of maybe an evolution of what Pep Guardiola brought to the Premier League. You kind of always felt that Mesut Ozil's time in the Premier League was going to be up or in modern football in general. His position as a number 10 where he sits, basically sits in front of the midfield and behind the strikers and especially just given the luxury to just roam around in the similar sense of like an old school deco right where you just get to pick the ball up be cute move it around manipulate as you please and obviously you get paid the big bucks because you deliver at the clutch moments right when it's needed when your team is one down in a champions league final or champions league semi-finals 89th minute you produce like a you know a ball that splits the defense that then leads to a cross at least a goal that results in a goal sorry so you know as much as they're a luxury player they're also the player that can actually you know really change things and unlock stuff going forward but you know for some reason whatever it is whether it's his own motivation whether it's the constant changing in managers since Arsene Wenger has left the club it just didn't work out of Mesut and unfortunately in the in the kind of rumble of that stuff I don't know when it happened but somehow somebody in the Arsenal executive board decided it was a good idea to give this guy a new contract and not only any contract, he got the contract that Alex Sanchez got, he got the contract that David De Gea got where he essentially was getting 200,000 plus 
playing for Arsenal, right? And I think at the time of writing, it was rumoured that he got about 300,000 a week playing for Arsenal. And considering how inconsistent Ozil was, considering, considering how old he's getting and considering that his position is becoming null and void in a modern game, it was a really ridiculous decision to give him that salary. So to give him that new contract. But he took it, of course, right? He's a footballer. He's, he needs to look after his own interests and the, the, the football... You know, being a football player is a really short career. Um, the industry itself isn't the most um, kind when it comes to footballers, right? If anything, the footballers and the fans are the ones that get fucked over the most by the owners or by the clubs. They don't necessarily care about us or the players that much. You know, we're, we're basically, in the fans' point of view, we are... We're fiends, right? No matter what happens, I support United, right? The Glazers have one of the the Glazers have essentially taken our club down, you know, down the dumps ever since Alex Ferguson has retired retired, unfortunately, right? So there's nothing that they can do that's ever gonna make me stop supporting my United and they know that. So they're gonna keep taking the piss um out of the fans, myself, and they're also gonna keep taking the piss out of players because they know by and large they can always um make it about the club, quote unquote, and obviously boot out players by putting out a narrative. And obviously the narrative of those he didn't really help because he's not the most you know, um, he's not the most pleasing player to the eye when he's not playing well. He just kind of languors around when he's playing, when he's up, when his um, fellow players are getting on him, he tends to shout back and argue. He's got a bit of a, um, he's got a little bit of a, I don't know, it appears like he's got a bit of a bad attitude on the pitch. I don't think it is. It probably just is his way of internalizing his own frustration at his own game. But he doesn't look good on the eye when he's not playing well. And in this modern game, as I said, with everyone pressing and he's just walking around, it's never going to help. It's never going to work, sorry. So I guess with Arteta coming in for Emery, there was this assumption that somehow Ozil's career was going to get resurrected. But, you know, Arteta was the former assistant coach at Man City. He obviously has seen Pep Guardiola really um, mold that Man City team into a team that he basically, into his team of his liking, where he pushed the players to their limits, where he kicked out Joe Hart, where he was essentially ready to bin Sergio Aguero before he kind of pulled up his socks. So if you're Arteta, you're not going to give Ozil any special, you know, you're not going to give him any leeway at all. You're going to, if anything, expect the same level of dedication and determination to kind of push and press the op oppositions or to kind of pull your sleeves up and do the dirty stuff as much as anybody else. He's not going to be a luxury. So when I said came in, he didn't play him and sort of resort, um, kind of, put him out of the squad and kept him on the bench a couple of times the rumors started swelling again you know it was the the bad egg in the, in the dressing room he needs to be let go he's on a massive salary and this narrative just keeps being pushed out and again don't get me wrong i wouldn't want those on my club right he obviously that doesn't seem like the most um easiest of players to have in your squad right especially with his support with erdogan back in turkey and he is kind of often you know, he, he tends to have some butt heads with the German FA for probably some legitimate reasons, but he's not the easiest player to kind of deal with. You know, he's kind of got a lot of stuff he deals with outside of football that would make his presence at a football club a little bit problematic. But Arsenal knew what they got when they signed him. They can't now turn around and say suddenly they're surprised that Ozil has turned into his play. He's always been this guy. So to now turn around and kind of paint him out to be a bad dude is sort of done in bad fashion and he came out and did an interview with the Atlantic recently and he gave some really insightful quotes as to his time at Arsenal as to what's actually going on and as to kind of his impression on how the narrative is sort of being written in front of his eyes and how he doesn't really care about it. And it's really eye-opening because you don't usually get players of his caliber or players in his position usually because they're keenly aware of the public perception that they're essentially stealing a living. So they tend to kind of put their head down. They don't want to cause more attention. But players like himself and Bale don't seem to actually care. They are really putting it to their clubs. And I think it's for a fair reason, especially in Bale's case. Bell was, if you believe the rumours to be true, Bell was all set to go to China. And Roman did pull the plug on that um, deal last minute because they needed to keep him around because they couldn't get the players they needed out or then the players they needed in to replace him in time enough so they need the bodies. And then he doesn't go to China last minute. They'll come, he gets told about it. And he's like, okay, F you guys, I'm just going to sit on the bench. I'm going to train hard. So I'm always available for selection so you can never put me in the under 19s or whatever. But that's it. That's the most I'm going to do. And he's done that so far. And it looks like, you know, for the most part, he's going to stay out his contract at Real Madrid and nothing's really going to change. So anyway, here's a quote from the Mezzo Ozil interview that I thought were pretty eye-opening. I'm going to get up here on the screen for you. Bear with me a sec. Boom. So this is it. Someone posted it. It's on Atlantic. I'm pretty sure you'll be able to find it. So this is Mezzo Ozil speaking. It says, um, this was not fair, especially for the young guys and I refused. I think this is to, regarding his refusal to take a pay cut 
during the whole COVID-19 thing, right? The, do you remember the beginning where they were trying to make out as if the players were the ones that were to blame? They should take some pay cut when it's actually the owners of the of these clubs that are, you know, taking in a massive salary that are quick to let go of staff members before they take a pay cut themselves. It's just a complete hot, a load of bullshit, but you know how it is. Anyway, he continues, says here, this is not fair, especially for the young guys and I refused. I had a baby at home. I have commitments to my family here in Turkey and in Germany, to my charities and to, and also new projects we started to support people in London. That was from the heart and not for publicity. And it's even, you know, reading this, it's actually annoying he even has to say this. You don't have to justify how you spend your money. If the club are dumb enough to all, to give you a contract in that excess, because again, reg like, regardless of what you think about Ozil as a player, there's no way anyone playing in the Premier League, I don't think there's any, any player in the Premier League now that can legitimately say say that they deserve three hundred thousand pound a week that should be reserved for the elites of the elites right the neymars and up should be getting that kind of wage maybe even the i don't know who's a good example like people in that kind of bracket if anything right the players underneath that no one should be earning that much it, sh it should never be a thing but you know again agents play up i mean agent power or clubs being run by agents maybe he has something to play in this <coughs> it continues it says people know who people who know me know exactly how generous i am and as far as i'm aware i was not the only player who rejected the cut in the end but only my name came out i guess that's because it's me and people have been trying to for two years to destroy me to make me unhappy to push an agenda they hope they will turn the supporters against me and paint a picture that is not true that's very very true what he's saying there i think that whole thing about leaking his name because i wasn't a fan of it anyway i think the optics were bad when players are rejecting taking the pay cut when there's a global pandemic going on it's not going to look good but in context when you understood what the clubs the clubs involved when you understood the fact that they have shady owners and the the staff were not actually look, looked after in that whole exchange you can definitely understand why some of the players were kind of hesitant as to why they should take a pay cut and where that money was actually going to go in the first place and if uh, Mesut Ozil's name to be leaked that was highly unprofessional whoever did leak it no money that's super disgusting because at the end of the day he's still playing for your club what you want, what you want to do, do you want to play imagine if this was worse than what it is which is already bad and then somehow the supporters took this personally and were kind of you know rocking up to his house Edward Wood style and wanting to you know demand answers from him and his family like that's really really irresponsible so I definitely agree with him with that the fact that he's saying that he thinks he's trying to turn the supporters against him I don't think that's true I think the supporters are against him largely I don't think anyone apart from Ty from AF AFTV likes Ozu I think everyone sort of kind of turned off of him I think any player that kind of outstays their welcome when it's clear that they're not going to be picked by the manager is always going to rub um, fans up the wrong way even if they understand that you're staying because you know you have a family to support and it's a job at the end of the day no one's going to look at it well because they do see it as you know you you are you're kind of taking away money from the club you know I definitely can understand his position it but i'm sure the fans aren't going to forgive him any sooner it continues here it says possibly decision affected my chances on the pitch i don't know but i'm not afraid to stand up for what i feel is right and when you are and when you see what happened now with the jobs maybe i was definitely true considering how bad they dealt with that i don't know winning the fa cup and a week later they let go of 50 people it's just like what are you guys doing man arsenal pr terrible it says here, in 2018, I had plenty of options that would have earned me far more money on a free agent, but I committed myself to Arsenal because this is the club and the fan base I wanted to play for. In that sense, nothing has changed. Mikel knows my quality and I'll be ready when he needs me. This we can obviously dispute. Um, I'm sure staying in London and earning 350k with your family settled, you feeling settled, because I'm sure he probably doesn't feel that comfortable in Germany anymore after what people from the German FA, and I think that guy from Bayern Munich said about him, right? Highly unprofessional, the things that they said about him, disparaging his name and kind of calling his character into question. I'm sure he feels more comfortable here in London. There's a big Turkish population here, probably got extended family. I live here for sure, but to suggest that somehow there is, it's all about the love of the club is like, come on, it's a bit rich. If you love the club, club you would have just packed your bags and left already because you're you're hurting the club by staying because every week when um Arteta doesn't pick you it turns into the Mesut Ozil circus right and it continues it says yeah I'm not going into preseason thinking final year I can chill I know I don't play these are not easy times for Arsenal and I want to help I still have a lot to offer and I train as hard as I can whether I'm in the squad or not if you're called in you have to be prepared i'm doing all the necessary work on the pitch with the fitness coach and the gym that's all i can do which is interesting because i think he posted a video on his instagram that he quickly deleted i've been training in his garden it's just footballers have the worst um have the worst um what do you call it have the worst reading of the room in it they don't know what they're doing in that regard but hey i, I rate him for standing up for himself <clears throat> he continues here says 
people always love love or hate you and the main thing is that the people who know you and what you what they think that's true what the people outside say about my play or my character is irrelevant they just speak bullshit to make publicity and they know nothing they know by using my name it will bring their attention which is definitely true he says um do it as much as you like i don't care or listen to people who don't know me i didn't get here because of them but because of the family and friends who trust and i always be behind me which is really true i think the the criticism about his style of play and how he kind of conducts himself on the pitch are, is valid i think we've seen it with the criticism towards anti martial which i thought was a bit um was a little bit um you know it kind of lacked on the insight saying Anthony Marshall wasn't committed because he had a sad face. I think if you actually watch him play for Man United week in, week out, you clearly know he's one of our better players, if not our best player in in terms of consistently always kind of uh, contributing to the team's success. He's definitely been up there with someone like a Paul Pogba over the last four or five years. But he has to understand, he's kind of where he kind of walks around the pitch and slumps around when he's not having a good game. is isn't the best, you know, thing to go especially in this era and also the fact that his position is becoming null and void no one needs number 10s anymore they're a bit of a luxury you know players can get or teams can get away with having a number eight playing in that position box to box maybe even a really creative number six that can you know imagine a far more competitive version of like a Georgino, right that can also sp- or maybe like a fabino is a good example right that can spray a ball that can obviously a support attack when needs be but can also screen the back line so to have somebody that just sits in front of the midfield and behind it, the strikers picking a ball up to turning, being cute and clipping balls over the top, it's a complete luxury. So he has to obviously realise that or kind of change his game up to accommodate such a thing because unfortunately, number 10 is his position. They're, they're now drifting out to the wings. They're pulling back to that number six position, number four position. You really need to be a little bit more, um, have a little bit more um, weapons in your arsenal in order to kind of succeed nowadays. <clears throat> and then lastly, he says, but I wish people would have done the same for the Muslims because Arsenal have many Muslim players and the fans as well, as it's important for the world to say that Muslim lives matter, which obviously I'm guessing is to do with the whole um, deal in China with Arsenal and the situation going on there with the native um, Muslim cities, uh, population out there that have been put in those kind of weird concentration camps, conversion camps sort of things. But, you know, that that's a bit of a stretch for him to say that the club should support his political leanings is a bit of a stretch. Um, that's obviously not what's going to happen. And I'm pretty sure he should be aware of that. Uh, but yeah, I'm a fan of him coming out and kind of backing himself in this regard. I don't think it's going to help his chances with the Arsenal fan base. I think they've made up his their mind about him, but I still think it's a good indication as to the shift that's happening now in football. Clubs for the longest time were fucking players over, you know, essentially promising them one thing and doing the other, binning them when maybe they haven't been given a fair crack of the whip or, you know, changing managers midway through their first season at the club. Just whole really horrendous things that, in general, you know, upset a lot of players, ruin a lot of careers and set people back a few seasons. So to have a player kind of finally stand up and say, hey, it's your fault for giving me this contract. I didn't put a gun to to give me this contract. I had other offers. I could have gone after my time was kind of like up in 2018. You gave me 350 bags a week. What am I going to do? Say no. You know what I mean? So I definitely get him in that regard, but I'm sure people like DT and stuff and Turkish on AFTV are going to go ham on this because this does sound a bit entitled. It does sound a little bit like a player that's happy to just sit on a bench and not play and collect his wages, which is not what you want to see in football. But you have to under, you have to accept, man. Some players out there will just... I'm sure as well he's stuff he's gone through in his life might just mean that he's just he's just over it he just treats it like a job now and if someone plays and they play him he's gonna be he's always gonna be professional right i think that's kind of the quote-unquote immigrant mentality right you're never gonna take the piss out of the job that you have you're just gonna do the best that you can but in terms of giving anything more he's not willing to do that and you know this is like similar to when you work in an office or you work in a workplace somewhere. As soon as you pass the probation, it's effectively impossible to get rid of you, right? It, obviously, if you haven't, then they can do whatever sort of nonsense, you know, make up KPIs and reviews and stuff and kind of get you out there and say, oh, you're not matching up our moral, our level of standards, even though the standards change every week. But in general, if you pass the probation, you're done, isn't it? You're pretty much cool. Hopefully you didn't hear that beeping there, but hey. But yeah, big up Ozil. Hopefully this works out for him and I'm sure the Arsenal fans are going to be raging, but you know, it's always good to see Arsenal fans get angry, isn't it? Always good. Anyway, next on the list, what else do we have here? We have Olivia Munn confirms what Whitney has abandoned her comedy friends. Yeah, this is interesting. So this is a a screenshot from Olivia Munn's Twitter. Oh, Olivia Munn, Olivia Munn, linked to her Twitter account where she tweeted out essentially what we've all been kind of thinking regarding the whole Brian Callen rape allegations. 
that he's effectively done in Hollywood. And it's a shame, really, because of, 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 out of him and Brendan, you definitely knew Brian was the one that had to take a bit of convincing into sort of understanding the power of podcasting and the fact that it could help his stand-up career. He always kind of seemed like he was chasing that Hollywood dream, which, you know, you're allowed to chase your dreams. You're allowed to try and make something of yourself in that arena, even if it's probably something that you're probably not destined to do. And he's obviously got the benefit of being a world-class, you know, stand-up comedian in his own right. But it took a bit of convincing, right? But even though he still kind of held that hope, he had a few cameos in movies, obviously with the Goldbergs and obviously his spin-off show. Then he was he had that brief stint in The Joker. So it was looking like the podcast and the notoriety of that was sort of helping his chances to kind of segue a career into Hollywood, which he probably would like to do even though he's advancing in years. But I always got the impression that whenever these kind of allegations come up and a lot of the prominent women in Hollywood who have got some real experience with me too especially olivia munn right she's got that horrible story i mentioned previously where she was essentially required to work alongside a convicted child rapist that she had no idea right or somebody that was basically uh yeah somebody that was on a sex offenders rich or something like that um she didn't know she kind of raised it with a the studio they kind of told her to sit down and stop making a big deal out of it and then her co-stars in the movie essentially ostracized her because they felt as if she was taking away attention from the movie they were starring in, right? So she's seen the bad side of that of that industry. She's seen the bad side of what can happen to your career when you kind of speak up to for or against. So for sure, she's a bit sensitive to it. But whenever you see someone like that coming out and writing a tweet like this about Brian Keller or about anybody that's being accused, it kind of gives you the impression it's done for them in Hollywood. It's kind of over. And it's also an indication that maybe Whitney Cummings has essentially chosen her position. She's chosen what bed she's deciding to lay in. So this is a tweet here from Olivia Mum. It says... It's a screenshot of the Los Angeles Times article that features Brian Callan that basically raised the allegations. It says here, that's a quote from him from the LA Times, says I've never raped, forced myself upon any woman not offered to trade stage down for sex ever. Callan said in a statement, I will not allow the counterculture to subvert what I know and as importantly, what they know is the truth. And Olivia Munn quoted it on 11th said, this isn't counterculture, quote unquote, Brian Callan. It's just called rape and sexual assault allegation that's been heavily vetted and verified by the LA Times. I believe Catherine Fiora Tigerman, Claire Ganseret, Tiffany King and Rachel Green. And of course, if you remember, prior to this tweet Olivia Mum was on Whitney Cummings podcast and she essentially said the same thing that she believes that if a story comes out in the newspaper regarding a prominent male in Hollywood concerning a rape allegation that most likely or not the story is going to be true no she definitely said it's definitely true because they're going to verify and vet the story which is ludicrous right to suggest that the New York Times or the LA Times have any kind of journalistic integrity and they're going to dot their I's and cross their T's and go through exhaustive process or figure out the truth is null and void you have to anyone that believes that is just a madness i think she's just saying that because it fits her narrative but the in, more interesting fight about it i think is that it's an indication that for sure whitney cummings is no longer one of the boys and if you've seen any of her posts on instagram and if you've seen what she's been posting on her stories and stuff it kind of feels as like she's definitely pivoted of trying to make the pivot away from hanging out with all the la store comedy yeah the the, the, the comedy store dudes which, you know, she's she's got her reason to do so. I'm sure she's probably have her reasons that she's going to explain or not explain. But it's interesting to see that pivot away from the lads and trying to be one of the Hollywood elites. Because what we know so far is that for sure, you know, they're going to if, if they're not if, if they're not going to come after her, she's definitely going to have to be. She's definitely going to have her feet put to the fire in some cases, right? There's no way that you can align yourself with these people, align yourself with these people and feel as if it's just going to stop at the allegation with somebody you might be associated with. They're definitely going to either quiz you on the amount of French, the friendship that you had, why you stayed silent for so long. There's going to be a lot of things that are going to be brought up and essentially there's no way that you can kind of squirm away from it. But there has been a really remarkable change in Whitney Cummins' output on social media. I feel like every other post is some kind of version of showing skin like i'm just on her instagram here now showing on the screen there's obviously a couple posts here with some skin shots her in the field there different change in color hair color some bath stuff some salacious things here and there either she's going through a midlife crisis or this is just her eventual evolution away from that crew but it does feel a world away from the Whitney Cummings we knew that used to kind of appear on Joe Rogan go on T-Fat K a lot and kind of bust jokes and have some fun you know even this picture here 
this is a very kind of un Whitney Cummings picture to see. Um, but for sure, this is definitely a decision that she's made purposely to kind of maybe make pull some distance between herself and all the other dudes. Oh, guess out of here. There we go. Good, get out of there. Sorry about that. Phone call in the middle of this thing. But yeah, there's definitely a shift here. You can definitely see a shift that's occurring. And I guess if you're Brian, you definitely have to um, come to the conclusion that it's over for that friendship. That's definitely done. Um, but maybe it's also an indication that Whitney Cummings maybe knows a lot more than she's leading on or maybe more than she's revealed because for sure most of these stories were kind of, you kind of felt as if, Maybe since the Chris D'Elia stuff is a good example, because that Brian Callan and Brenda Shub reaction when Chris was accused of stuff, which was, was just even looking back on it now, it's just it didn't make sense. But obviously, thinking back on it, they obviously were maybe given a heads up about stories coming out concerning friends of theirs in a the comedy scene, and they were trying to distance themselves in order to kind of avoid any blowback or any accusations coming their way of course in brian kellen's situation it never it didn't really help if anything it kind of exasperated um some of those um allegations but maybe in whitney cummins's position she heard something in a grapevine and was told by the higher up because you know she's always been regarded as somebody she's always been regarded as a bit of a talent in hollywood as a writer as a director as a showrunner she kind of gets a lot of props in that regard working behind the scenes i'm sure people have a lot of money invested in her for up-and-coming projects that are very kind of um cautious or kind of nervous about what would happen what the backlash would be and be like hey you need to get in front of this you need to distance yourself from these dudes and let it be known that you don't stand for this you don't agree with what they did blah 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 so that you can have a career once this stuff is over i'm pretty sure something that happened because it just doesn't make any sense why somebody that was so cool with their banter so um happy to kind of talk about an odd i remember one video she had of like speaking to brian and said something like oh yeah i remember once when i was taking you home and suddenly when i got into a car your dick was out and stuff like it's just you know what I mean like she was okay to make those kind of jokes and kind of banter with them or maybe she wasn't at the time maybe it was just her kind of trying to cope with it but it's really odd to see that person then suddenly transform into this person we're seeing now who's kind of purposely throwing all her friends at the bus not saying anything publicly or say, or maybe going out of her way not to say anything encouragingly uh good about her former friends but hey it's a Hollywood game isn't it? it is what it is and then I've got here yeah do you think it, and this is actually the, the clip of it actually them talking about it and thinking back like was did she was she always uncomfortable with this or did she find this funny at the time i don't really know but it's very odd to think this person is suddenly the person now that's got olivia munn on the podcast basically throwing dirt on her and friends names my car and I was like, sure. <laughs> this is it where is it <laughs> Ah, oh, God. There you go. Start again. There you go. And you were like, can I get a ride in my car? And I was like, sure. <laughs> and you got in the car, and I literally, like, turned the wheel, like, to, like, look where I was going, and I turned around, and your dick was out. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> old peekaboo dick. Was, it, old peek but it was so weird. No news. Because it no. Was, was it like, hard? Was it just By the way, how much better was this show back then? Like, what a dramatic fall from grace, man. I'm not sure whether it was... Brendan's ego post um, Showtime special, whether it was Brian Callen tapping out and becoming a little bit disgruntled, whether it was just their chemistry wasn't where it needed to be because they just kind of, you know, got tired of each other. I don't know, but this show was so much funnier back then when it had Evan the Beard as the producer. Um, MJ, not MJ, what's her name again? Oh, I forgot her name. Was it MJ? The other girl that they had as a girl doing all the social media. It just was a bit more of a i don't know a fun time a bit more of a, a fun time i sound like um uh what's his name that basketball player fun guy but yeah it was so much better back then man it's just come gone to complete crap i don't know why oh it was not hard which now that i look back i'm super insulted you were, you were impressed with my piece though, i think that, no you have an impressive what piece. did you say were you like hey man no i think i screamed and then just <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah and then i, I laughed i don't remember that i do remember that they Definitely of course you definitely don't remember of course he doesn't yeah. remember we, did kind of we made out one time but in like yeah. a laughing way yes like i couldn't like your but, move but i definitely is, show i probably I mean, here's i've how definitely I think seen went. your piece yeah. Wait. so what, what do you reckon was she uncomfortable with this back then or is this just like a sudden pivot or she just got i don't know she just moved on from that kind of comedy it's just very strange to see that from a kind of a fan's point of view from the outside looking in um but in general man would you like i don't know maybe as a as a 
if you're married and you have kids at home anyway, let's just take this. This not this is not even the SJW point, but isn't it a bit unbecoming? Isn't it a bit crude to be talking about such things um, in public in front of the camera with somebody that you might have been romantically involved in back in the day, whilst you've got a wife and child at home? Wouldn't you be a bit aggravated if that? Wouldn't you be pissed off if you were the wife and you saw your husband doing that, even in a joking manner? It's not the best thing to do, is it? So maybe as a consequence of this whirlwind of allegations it's a way to kind of get those dudes to become gentlemen or some way shape or form or to at least have some kind of level of decorum where they kind of avoid mentioning names and talk about these sort of stories because i don't know i've always found it strange anyway looking at it from the outside not even being approved just being like hey don't you guys have a wife and kids at home and you're putting out all your business this is wild but again maybe that's just the lifestyle to live and if you're a comedian you kind of have to be a little bit cuckoo in the head to do that job anyway to get on stage continuously you know bomb for five years and then suddenly get good and try and carve a career out of yourself in front of audiences it's, you know it, it requires a bit of an unhinged mental um mental person right i'd imagine so so ugh, i don't know and then last year da, 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 I was going, that's about it. Let's end that one but yeah i guess for sure a delivery man tweet was an indication that it's probably over for brian callan i think he's probably aware of that anyway but if there's an indication that hollywood has definitely kind of closed the door on him it's definitely that but i'll be interested to see if the allegations do get proven to be false what will happen to what will those doors reopen will those people individuals kind of reassess and kind of go back and double down in their positions or will they sort of offer an explanation or an apology i don't know but it's interesting to see that as a fan next on the list we've got yeah brian's best friend said he didn't rape anybody so this is from what is this from um this is from i forgot the podcast but stevie blue eyes basically sat down with this girl and basically detailed the entire story of what happened the actual rape allegation um that or no sorry he didn't say he, he kind of spoke about the allegation where the lady basically said that um brian callan offered to give her money if she was if she would exchange a sexual favor right i think that was one of the stories where she was kind of down in the luck she was fighting her um case to kind of get her kid um back from her dad and all that sort of madness you know marital affair problems and she came to the comedy store to obviously have heed some advice from a friend and maybe trying to lend some money for somebody that was doing a bit better than she was at the time but stevie blue i said categorically didn't happen because he was actually in the car when this thing actually went on so i'll play a bit of video for you now here mm -mm -mm -mm. yeah it's from the start actually yeah Hope it loads up, come on. I should actually load these before in the beginning, in it, but hey, you know how we do it, innit? We gotta all do things the way we do them. What can we do here? Let's get yeah. into this. It's so, um, it's so, it's so. Oops, not too fast forward. Let's go back again and back. So, this is uh, Stevie Blue Eyes on the Here for the Hang podcast. And play if you know. Come on. Running to our friend right now I it's just like it's i don't know what people want me to say about it because like obviously he's one of my best friends he's like my dad and like i'm like what do you want me to say you know i'm gonna defend him that i think it's so ridiculous i gave my i don't know if you read the whole article like i gave my statements yeah. to the la times yeah. and then all they like i like it's not like i gave a statement being like he would never do that he's just which obviously i feel i tell i feel obviously mm -hmm. like he'd never do that it's not his character but like i was there I was there for yeah. that fourth one in Philadelphia. I was there next to him the whole <laughs> night. And so like, that's why I felt like I had to like give my statement to the LA Times. I was like, listen, I was there. I Good witnessed it. But, like, fucking we're together the whole night. This chick was, came there asking for $2,500 to fight, to get a lawyer to get her kids back because she lost it in a custody battle or something. It's so, like that right there, like when the mom loses the kids and gives it to the dad, it's usually a red flag. I don't know. Right. <laughs> it's like getting it's a domestic violence. It's like getting a domestic violence call and they arrest the chick. That never happens, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. The dude always gets in trouble. So she wanted money. Callan was like, "No, I can't give you money," but he was still like being nice to her, just like, "Oh, let's just you know get something to eat. Let's hang out." Drives us back to the hotel, and when we get out, and we leave, and we just go back up to the Airbnb which we were sharing, and we only had one key to, so we had to go on the thing together. So like it was just such a non-story that the yeah. fact that like, and I'm telling the LA Times this, and all they, they say did is, not like, say all that, <laughs> yeah, did they? 
They just go like fucking up. He said he didn't. He was never alone with her, and he was an ex-con, and he was in federal prison. And yeah, I was they like, got what? A- and that's the issue that's at hand here right the issue isn't if you believe him or not the issue is the reporting so if you believe what stevie blue eyes is saying that he mentioned or he said he was there during the, that allegation where the lady basically said that um brian cannon would only give her money if she gave him a blowjob or whatever it may be if that's true what he said and he gave them that part of the story why didn't they include it in the, in the article you just include it and let the re- readers make up their own mind but they're so obsessed with kind of steering the story in a certain narrative and painting somebody in a bad light and basically being um doing it in bad faith that they're willing to admit parts of the story just so it fits their own narrative when really if you think about it honestly even if they included that bit of the story in there people would still probably come to the conclusion that oh it's his friend of course he'd say that right no one's ever going to believe what stevie blue eyes says anyway regardless because they're going to think i believe all women that she said it happened so it happened so not putting into a story really makes me question all the other allegations because if that's the if that for sure happened the way he said it happened then what's to it's it's fair to assume that maybe the other allegations didn't actually occur the way the los angeles times put it in the article and if that's the case if that's the case and it does transpire that more than one of those stories are false or not credible then what does that say about the people that are coming out and lambasting him and throwing him under the bus? What does that say about the industry that's pulling away from him without giving him a fair trial? This isn't really the way to go about things. And again, like I said in the beginning, it's pretty clear that maybe quite clearly due to his past behaviours and some stuff he says on the podcast, whether they are done in jest or, you know, just done to, you know, make us giggle and laugh. It's fair to assume that Brian Kahn is probably a creep. Right? He's probably a little bit, what's that thing called, sexually forward, right? He's probably a bit sexually aggressive in that regard. But in terms of painting him out to be a rapist or to being a, a full-on perv, no, he clearly isn't that person. But you could already paint him in a bad light if you went to by saying that he does maybe overstep the mark. And I think even Whitney Cummins said in one podcast that he's probably never heard no a lot. And he's, I think in their podcast, she deleted off her own show, which, you know, says a lot about her kind of character. But she even mentions that he's probably a guy that hasn't heard no a lot of the time in his life right so you could if you wanted to this you know ruin his name and his reputation in pretty dramatic fashion if you just reported the facts you'll probably do it he probably wouldn't have anything to argue but he might argue about some of the semantics you know the location the times and he might have his own interpretation but if you just stuck to the fact that this is a guy who when new meat quote unquote arrives at the comedy store he's the first to try and approach them whilst he had a kid at home and a wife because that's the angle you could if you wanted to really damage his reputation you could just say hey he had a wife and kid at home this whole time and you're still hitting on girls still going out on road um taking advantage of openness whatever right or just you know being you know making inappropriate jokes people he doesn't really know too well you could easily bear him with that but to make up not to make up a story but to purposely omit parts of the story that don't fit your narrative so that you can paint him out to be a certain way is really really disgusting and again goes to show that there's a lack of humanity in this issue like you're not cheating the victims well by doing this because if it does prove it to be false their names are going to be dragged for the mud you're not treating the person that's been charged with it well because regardless of what you may think of the guy you like him or not Kellen, his career has been completely ruined due to an allegation right that hasn't been vetted properly that hasn't been reported the correct way it's a really, really bad slippery slope to be on. And again, I think if you're Whitney Cummins, you have to be careful because if you want to align yourself with these people and you think that they're going to be the just ones or the righteous ones and they're going to stick to the truth and report things as they happen and they're going to be morally, um, I don't know, they're going to be, yeah, morally good people, you're, you're going to be in for a big fright. If they came after Callan, they're going to come after you as well. That's the issue. So, And again, it probably paints Callan in a bad light more because if you would have just stuck with Delia, if you would have just not been sitting there crying and sobbing that you know because he was afraid people were going to come after him, if you would have stuck by him, because they could have, right? They've got a TFK platform where they have hundreds of thousands of downloads a month. They have you know a legion of fans that listen to everything they say. They jump and follow them on every podcast appearance they're on. They could have easily said, you know what, this is our time to actually stand, put our feet in the ground, and actually stand with our friend. Just in, you know because he's our actual friend, and he brought you know the amount of views fucking Delia contributed to bloody TFK, especially you know during his heyday right with him and will sasso on it right there you know, the, i'm sure some of the episodes might be some of the highest view counts on there right viewer yeah i'm sure it must be especially the one with will sasso and callan and delia where he goes is it though for sure that one is definitely super high so they could have stuck with him and then when his story would have come out they would have had you know they would have built already a fortified 
kind of, you know, rock solid defense against this. They could have had shows they could have done together, talking about it, some ragging on it. They could have went a whole different way, but Frank the leave under the bus is what basically is essentially their karma they're receiving for all this and all this stuff is coming out people writing fake articles or articles that have a, a sliver of truth in them allegations coming up that haven't been vetted out properly and um, victims who are probably you know have their own reasons to go after Callan and are being allowed to just talk freely to press without being kind of questioned it's just the whole shit show of an affair and it's negatively affected everybody really in that circle right people are keeping quiet about it people have moved away they backed away silence and stuff and it's just a real 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 mess of a situation man but hey hopefully this isn't the case but it does look like this story was a complete complete fabrication if we believe what stevie blue has to say next one on this actually this is another just a kind of uh updates upon updates Callan actually appeared Callan actually did um Brian Callan did a what everyone else does, I think, when they get accused of sexual misconduct or something untoward or saying something, you know, a bit racy on social, they usually do a bit of a conservative um, apology tour because for, for the most part, those are the only platforms that will allow you to kind of speak your piece, which is really disgusting in that regard, right? If you get accused of something, you should be allowed to go on any platform you want to fight your case in good faith, right? Not obviously be, you know, ambushed by journalists or pundits that want to make a name for themselves and get a bit of a moment on social, but you should be allowed to the same platform that the accusers have, you should be allowed to have it too. Um, even if someone accuses you anonymously, you should be allowed to call them out if they call you out by your name. That should be a thing. But of course, Stephen Crowder's got his own um, demons or his own skeletons, his closet. He's obviously got, you know, people are not really big fans of his show in general and his political leanings and his point of view, whatever, put that to one side. Um, he obviously got in it and revealed some interesting developments in the whole uh, T5K thing. So one, number one, is that he's no longer going to be on T5K. That show has been basically rebranded what it is now. Because I think a lot of fans realised that on the description, they changed it and took off Brian Cannon's name and just put uh, uh, Brendan with different co-hosts every week and stuff and called him a talented or a successful comedian, which was mad. But I guess on paper he is, but hey, they called him a successful comedian. And he's obviously, they've completely distanced themselves from Brian Cannon. I think even though the first show back, he did mention he's going to come back on the show. But it seems like from the sponsors and the people that they're doing business with on the back end, because as much as Brian likes to, or Brendan likes to say otherwise, it's for sure, you know, T5K is their main cash cow. That's the one that brings them. That's the place where all of the sort of business avenues that Brian Brendan has been able to go down have kind of spawned from. Without T5K, he doesn't have his Fit Boy Bike Club, doesn't have Below the Belt, doesn't have all these other things that he does. That's the main cash cow. So they have to protect that, which is understandable. So I guess they came to a decision to kind of take him off the show, rebrand it, or not really rebrand, well, rebrand it in name alone or in description alone, have different co-host that hasn't really worked out too tough i think mike effort has probably had enough of brendan's interruptions it seems like for the judging by the last couple of shows i've seen but you know the quality has gone way way down if anything brendan's probably the best operator for that show because he's obviously got the business mind to keep that show alive but in terms of entertainment pro in entertainment purposes and providing an actual fun interesting hilarious show he hasn't got a clue that it doesn't doesn't work and i think you see that with the king and the sting that sort of works mostly because of fear of one's genius and they sort of play off each other really well because they have a genuine sort of friendship but without that without that comedic relief without the ability to kind of bounce off each other and kind of you know have a bit of fun with stuff it turns into just brendan inviting his friends in who are probably less less successful and sort of like play second fiddle it's a weird dynamic it doesn't work that well so they're going to rebrand it and now they've got their own show called the fire in the rinks which is you know hilarious and probably the most la thing ever right you've been accused of something heinous like rape and then you go out and try and make a behind a paywall show behind a paywall show <laughs> called the fight in the rinks you know the name rinks what was that spawned what the past few months maybe or something right um to kind of what in the hopes that you're going to get the fans that watch it because for sure the show on youtube is you know it's, it's dying right it's not good it was amazing back in the day then it kind of slowly but surely kind of dropped in quality maybe because they were concentrating on their stand-up at the time maybe because they just got too big-headed whatever the show quality really dipped so to suspect to expect the same fans that watch that to then go and segue over and watch it on patreon is a stretch but stranger things have happened brandon probably has as much as he has that weird formula where like in most celebrities you need to have 
you need to split the fan base 50 50 you need to have people that actually ride with you and people that really really think you're a piece of shit so i think because of that he's probably gonna have a lot of people jumping on that show and doing it and especially if they're able to change the format maybe maybe a bit more interesting maybe cover loads of cancel culture topics i don't know what they're gonna do on there but it's just a development and he sat down with a crowd that basically spoke about i'll play the clip for you now and then make some more comments on the other side this is from a twitter let me get up here Get rid of this, get rid of this, get rid of this, get rid of this. Hope this it works out quickly. Is it probably buffering now, jittering? But hey, bear with me a second as it loads. Biddy 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 boom. There we go, Stephen Crowder. Boom boom boom. Come on, there we go. Of course, loading now. Bang. Let's play this. The prevailing wisdom across the board is you got to lay low. You right. just have to be quiet because right. anything you say will keep it in the news. And, and I, 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 I just I think a human being and I think a country, for that matter, defines themselves on what they are willing to fight for and, and, and the lines they're willing to defend. Yeah. And, and so oh, like you defending your friend Chris Alia when you went through the same situation. Instead of defending him, you got straight in front of the camera without calling him and started sobbing and crying, fake crying, behind your glasses that you just got plastic surgery done on your lids at the age of, what, 55? Come on, man. Now he's Mr. Morality. Now he's Mr. Nobility. So for me, I, I'm not going to do that because I didn't do this and I'm not guilty of this. And so for me, I thought to myself, if I don't stand up, the, the number of people that I know that have had gone through something similar, who've reached out, or just people in general who said, please, please be the person to stand up and at least talk about this. Right. Because nobody wants to talk about the fact that <laughs> what? We I, do, I don't even believe that's true, but if it is true, you, you have a lot of creepy friends. If all your friends are calling you, telling you that you need to stand up for rape and sexual allegations, how many friends do you have that have been accused of that thing? Or you just mean in general? Dudes that get nervous about stuff like this. It's like, huh? We are losing due process. And I don't think anything anyone is necessarily to blame. But look, you have two factors. One is social media. If someone, and it doesn't matter who they are, it could be from 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, it could be whatever. If they, and if, if, if somebody says something about you and they said that you said something, that you did something, that's all that it takes yeah. for... Yeah your livelihood to stop right because nobody wants to get involved in that everybody kind of pulls back immediately but that's the issue i have with him he knew this prior he was super annoying i think in the last year or so with anything to do with cancel culture if you're a fan of defiant kid you know he used to go on these long unhinged rants about how cancel culture was basically ruining society and all this sort of nonsense right kind of getting trying to get in his idw bag but it kind of seemed like it always touched the nerve right and it kind of made you think hmm what skeletons do you have in your closet but regardless let's put it aside let's say he does have strong opinions and strong thoughts about um the negative effects of cancel culture and the negative effects of this society we live in where you can get essentially your life on your career can be put on hold due to an allegation i understand that if you have that kind of thinking why didn't you use that same way of thinking that same frame that same um that same uh approach or that same idea to kind of apply it to your friend Christelia. because if you would have stood up for him and fought his case under the same premise they would have probably been in a far stronger position together as a group but instead because he wanted to protect his own career and not his friends or not his friends that are coming after him who might get accused of things you know in the future which there's rumors of loads of other people are going to get accused of things as well going forward so if your favorite comedian is based in la you better start making your prayers now but if that was a, imagine if you would have done that. Imagine if you would have just stood up and defended Chris as a unit. They would have been collectively standing up to cancel culture. LA comedians. It would have been a big thing. They could have segued it and lined up with the IDW and did the whole thing over there. There could have been an actual situ, a little mini movement online. It would have been a bit cocky, yeah, whatever. But they could have done it. They could have done something where they kind of, you know, really um, asked the journalists that reporting the story, that Amy Kaufman woman, to, you know, answer for her, you know journalistic integrity how did you vet this story all this sort of stuff they could have done if they would have actually stood up for that one guy 
even though at the beginning of course when the story came out it was bloody you know it took the roof over everyone's head and was like, oh my god i was shocked about the story but if you really looked at the allegations behind what happened with chris D'Elia, they were flimsy at best they could have easily stood up for him if anything brian Callan's situation is probably far worse and far more toxic or far more radioactive to get near than chris D'Elia's one because you could maybe explain that away in some way shape or form but somebody's coming out of the woodwork and accusing you of rape and then suddenly we're seeing you know and then suddenly we go back and think oh yeah we remember that clip of you and whitney talking about you just flung out your dick on somebody when you're in a car it doesn't really look good for him in general so to sit there and say all this stuff whilst he knows willingly that he kind of pushed himself away from his friend and delete all these pictures of him and chris on his social media accounts it's like come on man you can't be this you can't be this unaware and well, so I would even say, about... I would even correct you and say it's not that there is no due process, it's there's no interest in due process. And I'll read this from the, the well, People article where this, this lady who came forward and accused you, people can read it, where she said she didn't submit to a rape kit because she thought it was invasive. She also didn't tell her dad because she was afraid her dad might hurt you. Which to me, this is just me, my opinion, I go, hmm, doesn't like, it sounds to me like you'd want the dad to kick, kick, kick a rapist's ass. You think so. Maybe well, bury yeah, him in a bathroom. But, but, yeah. but, but Stephen, the mistake is to get into what someone's mind mind how someone's mind works i think this is a much bigger issue yeah than just me i, I mean I, and, and that's very important oh no definitely it's a big issue than just you but for sure it's happening to just you important i i think that the fact of the matter is we live in a time when when if someone says something about you you can you can be annihilated and you and there's no redemption mm -hmm. and, and that is a fact and that is happening and i think it's a fun function of one Whatever has happened in social media, it is this sort of mob rule, this sort of thing that people jump on. But also, you have publications, you have credible publications that used to be really good newspapers and stuff that are desperate to get online subscribers, paying online subscribers. Right. And these newspapers are in real trouble. I mean, desperate trouble. Yeah. And so what happens is there's enormous pressure on journalists to create clickbait, to create sensation. Um, and, and, and so, so if you get more clicks, if you get more retweets, that's, that is the only way to survive. What happened? I don't know, Brian, man, as much as I think the allegations are dog shit for him to suggest that somehow the, the mainstream media is attacking him for clicks and ratings is a bit of a stretch. He's not that famous, right? He's not that well known. He's not the most well known comedian out of that circle. Let's be fair. I love the guy, great stand up comedian, probably going to be a huge loss to the T5K army. But let's be real. Um, if anything, this was more so people seeing an easy way to basically, I think the real target is probably Joe Rogan, right? They see a good way to kind of take him down by one by one, knocking off all the people that surround him and then eventually going and hitting the big well. That's probably the reason that they're attacking him in this regard. Um, and again, he's probably unlucky because he's the only character within that group that does actually have some skeleton in his closet, right? He does actually have some stories and instances that seem a little bit fishy, that don't seem the, the most um, appropriate way to kind of deal with women in the Hollywood industry. So for sure, if they wanted to find some information, if they wanted to dig up some stories about anyone in their community, it definitely would be him. And then um, now they've actually announced, I think he announced in the uh, Stephen Crowder interview later on, um, that the fire and the kid is now gone or is now you know been changed he's not going to be part of it anymore i guess until the allegations are cleared up and instead they're they've got their own patreon that they're doing now right called the fight and the rinks i'm trying to see if i can get it up here so they're going to be doing a show behind the paywall which is both somewhat funny and smart but also very very um tone deaf i guess in some regards if you've been accused of something like this wouldn't you be trying to spend all your money time and resources to kind of um clear your name instead of putting up a show on patreon um what kind of capitalizing on the drama i'm not sure what they're going to do long term in that regard and patreon isn't the easiest platform to maintain a fan base on as soon as their fan base don't see that they get any value for the money they're going to just unsubscribe and take away the donations or their support from you but it just doesn't seem like the best way to go about things and if anything there's definitely going to be cannon fodder for the likes of these journalists like amy kaufman that um reported the story the first place she's definitely going to report on this development and it's just not going to look good in terms of the defense now again if he's innocent i understand the reason to do it but come on it just seems a bit weird doesn't it going forward but <sighs> i guess they've got to keep it going he's got a house to pay for uh kids to look after i'm sure that divorce settlement money isn't cheap um whatever you know what i mean living in la doing your thing you know you got to make a living so i don't disparage the guy go and do your thing but i just think if you're really innocent you would really spend your time and money trying to clear your name it's probably not going to do make any difference because i'm sure you know 
people in the industry are happy he's gone in some regard because it seems like anyone that they do try and cancel they obviously have a bit of a axe to ground with that person anyway apart from chris hardwick it seems like no one actually gets cancelled and reintroduced back into the community and even chris hardwick maybe if you sat down with him he could probably say to you certain people have have kind of permanently backed away from him and you know taken away deals from him that he can never get back i don't know but there's not many of those kind of cases where somebody gets accused of something really heinous proves their name proves it um proves the story to be incorrect and then kind of is able to get their way back in the industry you have to be a mega mega star like a justin bieber right or that jake and josh guy right that recently been accused of something you can fight that on that level because you know you're such a big artist so much money banking on you that you're actually your actual sponsors and late record labels and the network you work with they're definitely going to you know help you and support you in any way they can because they've got too much tied up in your um in your image and what you represent to kind of just let the allegation run and run amok like that but um weird situation to be in they've got a patron now at the moment again i can't find it let me see if i can get it the fighter the fighter and the rinks patron see if i can get up on you they set up recently i'm pretty sure uh where can i find it the fire the fire pilot podcast oh, it's not here i can't find it the wizard thief the images anyway it's up there somewhere you'll be able to find it the fight in the rings podcast check it out if you want to i guess in that regard but absolutely shocking state of affairs for everybody involved anyway that was the action of the show episode number 354 I'm going to leave it there for an hour because I'm actually melting here. Um, if it's your first time listening, of course, make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe and leave me a comment down below. If you're listening via the podcast app, of course, make sure you leave me a five star review and share the show with your friends. And if you want to support the show for as little as one dollar a month, please sign up to the Patreon down below. Patreon.com for slash Agostino, A-G-O-S-T-I-N-H-O. For as little as one dollar, you get access to my entire library as well as the audio podcast, audio version of this podcast you're listening to right now. Two days or three ahead of everybody else before it goes out on YouTube. So it Make sure you sign up there. Until then, take care, be safe, everybody, and see you again very, very soon. Peace.